мною принято решение о проведении специальной военной операции. We are under attack. It is an attack against Western democracies and on the institutions that bind them. What Russia is much more interested in doing is depicting the West as a failure. The regime and President Yanukovych, they were trying to protect their enormous wealth. This is Kremlin File. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not only attacks, but every single day, uh, uh, Russia kills civilians because uh, they attack uh, usually uh, civilian targets uh, on Ukrainian territory. And uh, every day, uh, someone uh, is killed. And uh, you know, uh, people are not paying attention to this anymore in the West. And this is why Ukrainians are like begging uh, to. Uh, journalists and international media to continue speaking about that because uh, you know um, Ukrainians since uh, the, the 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 initial start of the war since 2014 they feel very much integrated into the Western society into the European society we consider ourselves to be Europeans and this is what. Um, people cannot realize like mm. the the other country in europe uh is being attacked daily uh by russia and others are just uh, you know discussing uh, when and how um they can help and not doing something immediately and that's why uh people feel so desperate because uh, this is going on for so long and still there is no uh, immediate resolve uh to this aggression from russia they are sitting at the un security council and every mm -hmm. time you know telling uh, another uh, lie uh, about uh genocide uh, of russian speaking population what what a, what genocide yeah. or something like that something completely out of uh, you know reality but they are still there and continuing pushing uh, through their uh, uh, lies and uh, disinformation yeah yeah and and this is not only um you know russia projecting because at the same time they accuse ukraine of genocide which is a complete lie this has never happened it never will happen ukrainians do not commit genocide at the same time russia you know strategically targets ukrainian civilians russian propagandists and politicians talk about erasing all of ukrainians they take the actions of kidnapping children and, you know, brainwashing them, erasing their Ukrainian heritage to replace it, you know, with Russian garbage. And they, you know, hit all the cultural centers. Um, right now, the newest, they, you know, banned Ukrainians in their textbooks as if that's it. Yeah. It doesn't exist. You know, so I mean, Russia's taking the steps and they make a mockery of all our Western institutions while the UN honestly is frankly useless and I don't even know why Russia is still sitting there. Um yeah. speaking of attacks, um, you know, the daily attacks, Russia again uh carried out another terrorist attack, it hit a hotel in Kharkiv. Uh two month old baby was buried under the rubble and the latest news that the baby died. Um, and just in general, Kharkiv has seen an onslaught of, of Russian uh, missile attacks, drone attacks. Can you discuss the latest there and just how everyone's been coping in Kharkiv and just across all of Ukraine um, this past winter? Uh, the situation in, in Kharkiv is one of the most difficult uh, uh, from from. Uh, Around Ukraine is because uh, one of the reason is because Kharkiv was already uh, like started to return to the city and life was uh, reviving again, like uh, not as it was pre-war, but more or less uh, like uh, people started to live their lives, and then uh, these uh, daily attacks. 
they knocked everyone out. Uh, Russia not only attacked daily during the daytime, meaning that uh, uh, yeah, it's very important also to know that Kharkiv is so close to the border with Russia that you do not have any time to react on the air siren. Because uh, between the uh, the launch of the S-300 from Belgorod to the moment you hear explosion in Kharkiv, it will be just one or two minutes. So there is like completely no chance to take wow. cover. So, uh, and Russia is attacking in the daytime when uh, people are outside on the streets. So basically you don't have any chance. It is just a matter of a fact, will it be you this time or someone else? And Russia started to attack uh, Kharkiv daily uh, and the Kharkiv city center uh, where residential areas and like almost everyone whom I know in the city, they experience uh, that attacks because it is daily attacks. Uh, these are daily attacks uh, in, in the city center of Kharkiv and uh, in the historical heart of Kharkiv. So this is not only like, uh, this is not only affecting civilians, but also uh, this affects the whole spirit of the city because the historical buildings are destroyed, the streets are destroyed, so something that was very dear to everyone in the city, this mm -hmm. is, it's no longer exists. And uh, uh, also there is information uh, all the time coming out from the military that Russia is concentrating troops around Kupiansk. This is yeah. the... Uh, uh, town uh, uh, on the in the east of Kharkiv, uh, which was liberated uh, during the counteroffensive, but then Russia all the time is trying to regain uh, it back. And uh, there, uh, the the Russian offensive is really very intensive. They all the time attack uh, Ukrainian positions, uh, and uh, this is why the situation in the city is quite bad because uh, people feel that um, many of them actually say that they feel the same as it was in the first days of the war, when wow. you understand that Russia will do everything. Uh, they will launch all kinds of weapons they have just on the heads of the civilian population to break the spirit, to make people run out, to crush uh, the city. Uh, so, yeah, it's quite bad. Yeah. There's been an increase, in fact, I think in the last two or three weeks, uh, a net increase every single day there in other areas as well, I guess. What most analysts are saying is that they, the Russians would like some sort of win, especially there in Kupiansk, before the elections in March. That's what they say. But this has been going on yes. and on. It hasn't stopped at all. And Maria, Absolutely. how... Mm, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to also to add because uh, Olga mentioned uh, the hotel in Kharkiv and that the baby was... Uh, uh, killed uh, in that strike then on russian social media and the russian you know uh, uh reports they will say that the these are the basis for, uh, I don't know, NATO uh, instructors or who, like mercenaries, how they call them, uh, who come to the city. But this is just totally non-true, and the the journalists mainly stayed in that in those hotels because uh, they were coming to cover the war and actually in these strikes uh, several uh, international journalist teams uh, uh, were um, injured uh, like members of the teams were injured because they were staying there at that time wow maria what is going on we don't get a lot of information from the occupied territories there are partisans there that are you no know, attached there are other groups as well that are giving information. I think it's very important to talk about this because most listeners don't understand what it means to be under occupation, um, which is you know, the goal of liberating you know, these areas. Can you tell us a little bit about what is happening inside those areas right now with, with, the, with the information that you actually have? This is so good you 
uh, you touched uh, on this because this is very important also uh, and this is very often uh, is missed uh, from the you know the coverage of the war in Ukraine uh, or just uh, uh, analysis because uh, when uh, like people say why just you don't stop and leave uh, the, the territory to Russia but this is not about territory this is about people who live there and who wait uh, when the t the, they will be uh, deoccupied, when they will be free. And I have been uh, in Kherson, uh, which was liberated uh, like more than a year ago. And many fam families there, actually, I met one of these families. So they live uh, on uh, on the territory that is that was deoccupied in Kherson city uh, itself. And their relatives, close relatives, like... Uh, uh, grandmother, one of the sisters, they are living on the occupied territory uh, on the other bank of Kherson, wow. uh, on the other bank of Dnipro River. And uh, they all the time waiting uh, for troops to liberate them. And when occupied uh, territory of Ukraine, it's because they didn't have a chance because uh, basically keep these civilians as hostages because they mm. do not allow them uh, to move out or to move to the uh, to to move uh, to Ukraine. So uh, these people are waiting for Ukraine to come, and, and uh, the uh, we see uh, that uh, the resistance movement is quite um, strong there. Uh, and uh, actually those uh, occupiers, uh, Russian occupiers, they don't feel safe because uh, there all the time are some kinds of uh, attacks on them, on their cars, on them personally. So very often they move in groups because they think that by, mm -hmm. by doing this, they're more safe, but they understand that uh, everyone there on the occupied territory is is wishing them to disappear uh, at least. And uh, so uh, they understand that uh, this moment soon or sooner or later uh, will come and uh, they don't feel actually that this is the uh, territory where they can, you know, uh, feel freely because it's not because they are occupying illegally territory of Ukraine and they, they like understand what will be the consequences for them when Ukraine will be able to deoccupy de de this territory. Yeah. Hi, everybody. If you enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to help us out with our independent work, please subscribe to Kremlin File on Substack and on our YouTube channel. Kremlin File is hosted by Olga Lautman and me, Monique Kamara. Our production team is headed by Mary Kaparov and the theme music by Oreste Kamara. So please don't forget to visit our Kremlin File substack for links to our socials and to wherever you'd like to listen to podcasts.